What is up, YouTube? I am your host, Sam, here today with Adrian, and we'll be giving you a brand new episode of the Drachmas and Denarii podcast. Today, we're going to be going over some new ancient coin wins. I'll be talking about some interesting Byzantine Tornezes and Trachies, and my co-host Adrian is going to be talking about some interesting Roman provincial Tetradrachm wins. So, with all that started, I uh, better ask Adrian, how are you? It's been a, a hot minute since we've done a podcast. Yeah, it's been it's been a while. Uh, no, I'm I'm, I'm fine. Uh, just like uh, strolling through the through the entire like coin world. Uh, yeah, having a blast. Yeah, I feel that we just had whatever. What was it? C and G one twenty. I forget the exact number, but the feature auction, a bunch of good stuff. Nax coming up. Nomos this weekend. It's definitely an exciting time for the collector. Definitely. Yeah, so I'll go ahead and get us started off here. Uh, my first coin win is pretty interesting. So if you look uh, at this photo, you can see I've got two Byzantine Tornezes in my hand. And these are pretty much a small silver uh, or a billin denomination. So it's kind of part silver, part copper. And these came about in the Byzantine world about the uh, late 1200s. And they're called the Tornese due to the fact that they imitate Latin, local Latin Western issues. Uh, and in terms of imitation, they have brand new Byzantine designs, but they use the old standard Latin weight denominations. So the one on the right here is about 0 0.6 grams, and the one on the left is a, roughly the same, I think a bit lighter. But these are super interesting because the type is hitherto unpublished. It's not in any of the standard references. You won't find it in Seer, uh, Bendel, Dumbarton Oaks, any of those places. So the coin on the right, sort of the damaged, broken one, if you see, that's the one I actually came across in a group lot a while back in 2019. And I didn't know what to make of it. Uh, so on the obverse, you can see we have a Byzantine emperor seated on a throne, holding across his lap a sword. And the reverse is a winged patriarchal cross. So it's a pretty interesting type, and I just thought it was funny that I managed to grab a second one of this unpublished type. And... Thanks to this left example, you can see uh, that I recently picked up a brand new win. It's of a higher purity, which is interesting to note, and it's got a full legend on there. You can see the A-N Delta P for Andronikos, the first four letters there. Uh, so that sort of clarified the ruler. I wasn't entirely sure on that rightmost example. You can tell, like the legend, it's pretty rough. You could make out the Delta there, but any other, th any other letters you couldn't. So I wasn't sure if that was Michael the Eighth or Andronikos the Second, but... I'm glad to say this new example I picked up has let me determine the correct ruler. And yeah, it's a pretty interesting Super type. Interesting, I, I'm uh, working yeah. on an article right now that's going to get these published. That's what I was doing before I hopped on this call. So here, hopefully within a couple months, I can get these types actually published out there. Very cool. Like, uh, yeah, unpublished types, whenever they're found, uh, I think it's really uh, intriguing to, to, to know more about them. Yeah, I just it's thought it was icon. so funny getting two like that. I just... <laughs> Not only one yeah. of an unpublished type, but then finding a second, much better example. And from different auction houses, quite um, a ways apart time-wise. It would have been across like is two or three years now. That we're, is the iconography that we're seeing right now with the winged cross, is that is that normal for, for this sort of period? Uh, sort of, yes and no. So, kind of starting on the obverse here, you can tell with the military iconography, I'm not sure how well that comes across the camera, but oops, the Byzantine Emperor is holding a sword across his lap. I don't know if you can see that here, but that's very unusual for this emperor. Uh, kind of to see these military symbols this late by an emperor holding it. His father had lots of those, but not him. So seeing this sort of actual design on his coins, it's the first time that we have an emperor seated on a throne with a sword type for Andronikos II. And with this winged patriarchal design, that's the first time it's seen on Byzantine silver at all. So both sides are very unusual in depiction. Yeah, just kind of funny to see, like, across these two examples, there's quite a different style, especially here in the reverse. You can tell those, cr like, crosses are quite different. So the fact that we've got different obverse and reverse dies would hint towards a large mintage, but I guess surprisingly, for whatever reason, not many have survived. What sort of purpose did, did like, a smaller silver denomination actually, like, place uh, uh, or, like, have in the economy at this time? Why, why were they yeah, made so, so small? This would have been an attempt from the Byzantines to try to f sort of upstage Venetian currency at the time. So you had a lot of Italian traders coming in with their own currency. And uh, for whatever reason, the Byzantines wanted to have their own sort of competing denominations, and they didn't want to use Italian currency and be dependent on that. So they started issuing their own designs. And this would have been a part of that. Um, and particularly during the reign of Andronikos II, his first reign, uh, before he had co-emperors, uh, there's a lot of variety in design, and we don't exactly know why. It just seems like the mint was sort of experimenting and trying to test out new designs. 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, like, I'm, I'm, I'm. <laughs> it's super interesting to just like hear you, uh, hear you talk about it. Yeah, so uh, um, it's pretty interesting too. I've been looking at sort of reevaluating the timeline of when certain denominations were introduced. I, I don't know how familiar you are with Byzantine coinage, but the silver trachy came before this, and then the sort of basilicon, the flat silvers afterward. So sort of figuring out which emperor issued what coins and at what point the denomination shifted is super interesting. And I think I've got some interesting work that'll help shed some light on this period. Yeah, because if, if I under, understood you correctly, this denomination as a whole isn't very obscure, no? Uh, there's one type that's very common. So you've got, not very common, but within the frame of Byzantine silver, it's one of the most common types of just the emperor standing holding a labarum and a globus cruciger. But besides that, almost all these types with sort of interesting one-off designs are extremely rare. And it's kind of an odd case where you've got multiple sort of types, where you only have one or two surviving specimens. So pretty much every every type in this era is rare, but you've got a lot of rare types, if that makes sense. Sure, sure, sure. I, I wonder if there's any, is there any way to, to, to do some sort of stylistic determination? Uh, uh... To make sure like where, where, where it was minted uh so if where it was minted maybe you have thessalonica and philadelphia at this point but they're sort of by the reign of andronicus ii they weren't used very much so that's not an issue but you do have the emperor after andronicus who's andronicus the third so there is some distillation or style used there to determine which emperor issued which but there's a huge drop off in quality so it's pretty easy to tell which emperor issued what coins Oh. So yeah, overall, I thought a pretty interesting denomination. Just funny that I was able to pick up two of an unpublished type. I mean, what are the odds of that? Pretty lucky. Uh, yeah, and and where can we see your 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 paper on it when whenever it's uh, published? So we'll see. I'm going to uh, submit either today or tomorrow. I've got to wrap some things up. But to the magazine, the journal Coinon, I forget exactly how it's pronounced. But uh, with all luck, it'll get accepted there. Maybe with a revision or oh. two, published in a few months. So fingers crossed Ooh. on that. Yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah. And once that gets sort of finalized and published, I'll make sure to include a link on the YouTube page and all that so you guys can find out more about these articles and sort of see how these types sort of play into that and change our understanding of the period. So that's a cool coin. Um, this one right here is an interesting type I picked up. It is an unusual coin of a despot. So in the late Byzantine world, you had sort of rankings, a hierarchy of the emperor was top and the despot was sort of underneath him. In some ways, you can kind of imagine during the imperial era, you might have an emperor and Caesars. You would here have an emperor and despots, except there's no blood relation, but they were kind of like a sub-emperor ruling in a different land in the name of the official emperor in Constantinople. So what you see here is a figure on the left is Michael II. He is a despot of Epirus. You can see the XM legend, which indicates it's him. And he is being crowned by the Byzantine emperor John III Vatatsis. And this specific trachy is extremely rare. I believe this is the fourth known in private hands, at least. And it depicts uh, a certain date, his coronation as despot in 1248. And we know that um, just because of like, the historical context around this and the fact that he's depicted with John III Vatatsis. Uh, and so he was trying to become a pretender to the, to the throne in his own time, but it basically got defeated by John. And the terms were submit to John, take an imperial princess and become despot or pretty much lose everything else. So he submitted. And what's interesting about this coin is you can see the difference in depiction of the imperial garb between a despot and an emperor on one coin. So Michael here on the left, you can see he's got a very round cap. Whereas a usual Byzantine emperor, their hat is flat and round, almost like a... Um, like a crescent moon, this is sort of like a half dome. And that's called like the, the Kulomeleon, I don't know how you pronounce it, but it's a certain specific type of crown that's given to the despot. And you can see here the despot Michael is holding a palm frond where, although you can't see it on this example, the Emperor John next to him is holding a cross-tipped scepter. And you can kind of tell in the intricacy of the body detail that on the left there's not much adornment, not many dots, whereas on the right you see tons of dots and lines. And all those dots and lines represent jewels and gemstones. So you can tell that the despot does not have as fine an outfit or garb as the actual emperor. Oh. So here's just, you can see the details a bit better on this coin, although, or on this photo, it's still a bit washed out. But you can kind of see the emperor's John's face a bit better and kind of seeing him reach over with his hand and crown the despot. 
I have to I have to ask is the the, the detail with the uh, with the palm that Michael's holding is is that normal for 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 this Yeah, it's era? sort of seen as like a um in some cases a sub symbol kind of like the emperor would have the labarum the sign of the cross on a post made famous by Constantine or a cross tip scepter. You kind of see the sub emperors and despots using palm fronds. A lot of times a palm frond is given to a saint. So you might see like St. Constantine in imperial garb oh, okay. holding a palm frond. So it's sort of an honorific and important symbol, but not quite at the same level as a labarum or cross tip scepter. And you can kind of see that in this certain association that it's sort of given a sub status on this coin just by association of the despot having it and then the emperor having a cross tip scepter. But yeah, it's sort of a yeah. super interesting coin that kind of allows you to see the stratification of late Byzantine society and see the different sort of costumes and the, sort of the, the practical outlooks, I guess, of Byzantine society put in one coin. And it's interesting too that we know the exact year. There's not many Byzantine coins, especially this period that we can date specifically to one context or event. But we know this is the uh, sort of official treaty and marriage of the despot Michael to the Emperor John, 1248, as I mentioned, so that's pretty cool. And then the reverse shows St. Michael. Uh, this one's sort of double-struck, not too much going on. You can kind of make out the wings on either side, but yeah. Yeah, sure, yeah. Pretty was cool he, was coin he in, uh, Was he in some sort of rebellion before this? Because obviously he's, he's submitted at this point when, when this coin was struck. Yes and no. You sort of had rival states. This is post-1204, so you kind of had the main Byzantine Empire get sacked by the Venetians. And following that, you sort of had different states break off, and each of those broken off states claimed to be the true successor. But in the end, the emperor of Ni or the Empire of Nicaea, which John III was emperor of, became the strongest. And sort of through that, they absorbed the other states and became the empire in exile and eventually took back Constantinople. So maybe at the beginning of Michael's reign, he would have been seen as an equal partner, but by the end of it, Sort of his empire lost and John's won. So John and his empire later on became the true empire, so to speak. And with hindsight, he becomes um, sort of a usurper or maybe someone who rebelled. But at the time, it certainly wasn't clear. Interesting. Yeah, so those are my coins. I just thought it was pretty cool. The trachea of the despot John and then these two unpublished Tornazes. But now we can go ahead and check out your coins here, which are pretty interesting as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I've um, I've been doing some some uh, branching out lately, uh, trying to to find out um, more about like where where I want to be in my in my collecting, and um, I think I've landed pretty pretty firmly now with uh, with Republican provincials. Um, this is an area where uh, there are lots of different types that are very usually pretty obscure. Um, they're usually pretty rare, uh, especially compared with uh, the ordinary imperial provincials that, that would come later. Um, but um, these types often uh, have implicit messages of, of power and of uh, encroaching uh, Roman influence in, in the Greek world. Uh, so on this type, uh, which is a uh, from the first outlook, uh, looks like a, a, a normal tetradrum from from Thassos. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the uh, the obverse uh, showing Dionysus um, uh, wreathed, uh, very common. Uh, and then on the reverse, uh, Hercules uh, with the legend uh, Heracleos Thuteros Tathion, uh, which means uh, Her Heracles, the savior of Thassos. Um, but uh, a very small detail makes this coin uh, very different from the ordinary uh, Thassos issue, and, and this is uh, uh, that's the monogram here. Um, this monogram is a it's a, it's an A, Y, and sigma, uh, and it is believed that this monogram belongs to a a Roman quaestor uh, who served in. Uh, in Macedon uh, during the years 90 to, to 70 BC. Uh, his name was Isilas. Uh, he's actually not really recorded in our in our histories. We don't really know anything about him, uh, nor about his, his family or, or where he came from. Um, but he struck a, a, an abundance of coins in uh, in, in, in Macedon. Um, I think we can skip to, to the next page. And do we know why he put his own monogram on there? I mean, there were a lot of sort of 
uh, I forget the exact title. I'm not too familiar with the era. Maybe proconsul is the wrong word, but Roman officials governing the province. Was he the first then to put his own name and monogram on these coins? Uh, no, not really. Okay. Um, but uh, but he, uh, he he served as a quaestor in in the province of Macedonia. So so that would mean that he uh, he was in charge of um, uh, tax collecting. He was in charge of uh, uh, he probably held some sort of um, uh, imperium or or, or the um, the Roman authority to command the um, armies. Um, so this would empower him to do a lot of um legislative and um uh, of uh, authoritarian uh, things in the province okay. uh, so he he, w he wouldn't have had the rank of of say a, a proconsul or a propraetor but he would definitely have uh the power to 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 yeah say, say take taxes or 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 um uh or command armies probably um that's super interesting yeah, I so said, i notice um or sorry, I don't, don't mean to interrupt, but the coin we just looked at, no, he no, had uh, sort of a slight monogram, and here we see his full name on there. Is this a later issue, maybe, of like growing confidence, or why might he only put a monogram on one coin, whereas putting his full name here in a different one? Um, so the chronology is very difficult to um, to assess. Uh, the 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 main reference for these coins uh, was written by a man called uh, Bauslaw. Uh, and he, he tried to, to collect as many dice as possible in order to try to uh, make some sort of dice study and, and try to figure out, okay, which coins came first, uh, what sort of uh, changes happened uh, uh, during the different emissions. Uh, because keep in mind, this, uh, this type with uh, Alexander uh, on the obverse and... Um, uh, the, the the reverse with Isilas on it uh, was a very large issue. It was a very large omission. Uh, there are thousands of these today, uh, which tells you that, that this was not a, a small local uh, emission, but rather a, a very large uh, uh, minting and then striking with, a, with a, a fair amount of dice. And so what do these symbols on the back represent? I kind of see, uh, is it a bucket-like item, some sort of staff and a table? Is that Hercules' club, maybe? I think they're better represented on the on the uh, the coin to your right. Oh, oh wow, uh, there we go. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, so so <laughs> this is a, a coin that's in, in slightly better shape. Um, but on the, on the left here, uh, we see a sort of, uh, you said bucket. It's, yeah. it's a basket. Basket, okay, um, close enough. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's a basket called a a a, a kista, um, and uh, they were used by Roman quaestors when when collecting taxes. Uh, so so a Roman quaestor would put the the, the taxes in this uh, basket. Um, and in the middle, uh, we see a a a, a large club. Um, this is often, obviously, it has huge uh, implications towards. Um, uh, Hercules uh, mm. and, and so forth, but it, it is actually thought that this is a um, a symbol of 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 power, uh, so a symbol of of imperium, the Roman authority to command. Okay. Um, so that that's that's one th that's one line of thinking, but we don't really know the significance of the club here. Um, but uh, there is a slight possibility here that Isilus is trying to evoke. Uh, that he has uh, the authority to command armies, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and what's to the, the right, right there? Yeah, uh, it, it's a chair. Um, uh, it's 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 called a cella quaestoria, uh, and it's uh, it's basically the chair that the the quaestor would sit in when performing his duties. Um, Roman quaestors in the provinces, they they um, they were given a a, a myriad of of tasks. Um, so it, it, it could be tax collecting, but it could also be to, to perform the role of an arbiter in, in, in both le in, in legal disputes. Uh, so from this chair, they would perform their duties. Um, they would arbiter uh, local conflicts uh, or, or, say, collect taxes. And I know you've uh, put together a nice photo here that kind of shows everything put together. Yeah. Um, so um, the these types uh, they are thought to all be related. Um, obviously, the the coins below they share. I mean, very similar iconography, and they can be tied together that way. 
Um, the coin on the lower right uh, is a is a rarer subtype of mm -hmm. the Isilas uh, uh, issue. Um, on the obverse, it, it's it can it's pretty hard to see. It, the coin is not really in the in the best of shape. Um, but on the obverse, we can actually see a Latin inscription um, where it says Kai. Oh and yeah, then, definitely. I see that now. And then I'll circle P that, R. The viewer. Yeah. Um, so, so th th this, this is, th so this obverse is actually bilingual. Uh, it says Kai PR, which means Kaisar uh, Praetor, mm. uh, Caesar Praetor, uh, and then, uh, uh, and then the the standard uh, Macedonian uh, Macedon in Greek yeah, following it. Um, Very cool. Yeah. So, so this coin is thought to have been issued by uh, Lucius Julius Caesar. Uh, he was a uh a an older member of of julius caesar's family uh who served as a uh, pro praetor in in uh, uh, the province of macedon uh between 70 to 65 we're not really certain when really um so but he 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 took the uh the existing uh coin of isilas that was being struck in macedon and he added his own his own name and title on it. And so, do we know when that first took place? Were the Roman sort of official coming in with these local emissions and putting their own name or monogram on there? I mean, it seems that a lot of these provinces were controlled since what, like the one sixties, one eighties BC. But you don't really see these sort of names come up till later, or at least it seems like that. I'm not sure if you have any more knowledge on that when that sort of first took place. Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, it, it 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 was a slowly was a creeping sort of thing uh in the beginning uh the romans uh, just continued striking local coins because that's what uh, the locals were used to and that's what they accepted when when doing their transactions um but roman officials slowly but surely started to implement their own designs their own elements to these coins uh, as a way to to obviously uh signify their power um this did not become, uh, I would say, commonplace until the the beginning uh, of the first century uh, BC. Um, there were other co other issues that had Roman uh, titles on them, uh, but they were they were far and few in in between. Okay. Yeah, that's quite the the trio here. I think it's nice to see how they all tie together. And so, with the Asilius, or how do you how do you pronounce that there, Asilius? I see less. I see less. With his issues, I find it interesting. He's got his name on the reverse, but you have, with the case of Lucius Julius Caesar, his name on the obverse. So you kind of have two different functionaries putting their name on the coin. Was that common to sort of have maybe like the overarching authority on the back and a, a magistrate's name on the obverse? Uh, no, not really. Um, so by by the point uh, that Lucius Julius Caesar was in the province of Macedon uh, during his tenure, um, the coinage of Isilas had become so widespread and so commonly used in the in the area uh, that it made no sense for him to change it. Because you have to keep in mind, um, when transacting coins in the ancient world, a lot of it was um, dependent upon uh, both the 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 weight and 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 the feel of the coin, but also the design. Uh, so when you're doing transactions, when you're buying food, you're buying a house or whatever. Um, the person that's uh, receiving your money, he's checking. Okay, uh, is, this is an, this is an Athenian owl. I remember. I, I've I've handled lots of those. Uh, I feel safe uh, taking taking this sort of money. But he, if he sees a, a design that's new to him, uh, he will probably be pretty wary actually in 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 uh, taking that sort of uh, money uh, if he hasn't seen the design before. Makes sense. Um, yeah, so, so it's kind of like a vestigial then. Yeah. So 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 for 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 Lucius here, um, he, he's actually pretty subtle in the way that he's uh, he's uh, marking the coins that he's uh, issuing uh, by just like having a sort of slight uh, uh, like legend in Latin with his name and title, um, but keeping the 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 uh, the integral parts of the. Uh, the coinage of, of Isilas there. Very cool. Do you know how long these continued in the name of Isilas, the issues? 
Was it um, like well into the empire, or did that stop with the sort of the fall of the republic? No, uh, these were these were, were probably phased out in the um, late uh, 60s to early 50s uh, BC. Um, we don't really see these um, after that point. Obviously, uh, it's really hard to, to figure out a chronology of the of these because we have so little um when it comes to horde date that we have so little when it comes to to, to figuring out uh, which dice come first uh which dice come second uh it, it, it's hard um but um probably in the early 50s these were not produced anymore hmm. interesting well i'd say that just about rounds up our discussion here and thanks for coming on and sharing these types it's super interesting to see this sort of Roman Republic provincial coinage. Yeah, and I, I can not say nothing but the same to, towards the, the Byzantines we saw previously. Uh, there are uh, there are so many coins that um, you don't get to see very often. You don't get to, to learn about. Uh, and when it comes to me personally, I, I, I don't know a lot, a lot about uh, Byzantine coins. So uh, fascinating. Yeah, well put. Vice versa here, just kind of seeing these different areas of coinage. And that's part of why... I think at least I enjoy doing this podcast is hopefully spread my own knowledge to people out there who may not know much about Byzantine coinage and sort of just, yeah, help bring exposure to the field and then vice versa, learning from you, seeing what you collect. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, well, thanks for again for coming on and we'll see you all next week. Mm-hmm.